Welcome to the Orthopedic Indications channel, where we discuss medical education for medical sales consultants and reps. Hi, my name is Nick Strasser, and uh, you've uh, come across Indications. This is a platform uh, focused on uh, medical education, uh, particularly for those who are in medical sales reps, but certainly could have application to a lot of different uh, backgrounds. In this particular video, I'm talking through fifth metatarsal fractures. This is a talk that I put together for our SEC meeting. And just uh, a little bit of background of the fifth metatarsal fracture, where it gets its name, where it gets its name from, and how we're currently managing these, um, and some thoughts on return to play. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, make sure you check out other uh, uh, videos that we have on our channel and uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Thanks. There may not be a more famous eponym than the Jones fracture. Uh, if you, if anyone uh, follows sports, as soon as they say a Jones fracture on ESPN or whatever uh, news, uh, sports and news cast you're listening to, you immediately know what they're talking about. Um, Historically, that's the fifth metatarsal has been associated with uh, Sir Robert Jones. And um, the legend has it that he sustained a Jones fracture, and that's kind of how it all started. But, you know, he was really instrumental in grandfathering all of orthopedic surgery. He um, was uh, very instrumental in bringing around new technology like X-ray. Uh, he wrote textbooks. He mul described multiple techniques. There's a tendon transfer that we just still describe after him. There's a splint, uh, like an after-surgery splint that we use that we describe as a Robert Jones splint. And he did a lot of other, uh, contributed to other humanitarian efforts, such as um, taking care of a lot of people who were, couldn't afford health care at the time. Uh, he volunteered for World War One at the age of 57. So really unique personality, uh, and certainly we owe a lot to him in, uh, in the in historical context of, of orthopedic surgery. But we're here to talk about fifth metatarsals, and the reason we associate Jones fracture with a fifth metatarsal is that he actually had one of these. And he wrote it up as part of his case series in which he was patient one. Um, so this is his x-ray, and it was described in a text in 1902 where he twisted his foot. Now, up until that time, the association was if you had a metatarsal fracture, it was associated with high-energy trauma, so usually a fall at that time. But when he twisted his foot, it was relatively low energy, and now – and described this fifth metatarsal that occurred along with six other – or five other patients, so six total – now, we know that currently that that oftentimes is the case. It's a lower energy type injury, but at the time, that was a relatively new finding. When you describe fifth metatarsal fractures, proximal fifth metatarsal fractures, we think of three different zones. There's zone one, zone two, zone three. Zone one is a pseudo Jones, which is an avulsion type injury. A zone two is at the fourth, fifth intermetatarsal space that you can see in picture B. And then zone three is going to be distal to that. Now, zone two has been a little bit notorious to be difficult to heal, and we describe what's called a watershed area. And a watershed in like, uh, geography or topographical terms is a area of land that drains to a particular point along a stream. But in the human body, what that means is, is there's a relative area of lower blood flow compared to the rest of the bone. So in the fifth metatarsal, you have this relative area of avascularity that's starred here. Now, the ends of the bone and the middle of the bone have pretty good uh, nutrient vessels. You can see that there's pretty good blood flow into that area. But in the area that we're concerned about, you see a uh, less dense capillary influx into that area. So less blood supply available or nutrients available for, to promote healing. Uh, a little bit distal to that, we call a zone 3. Zone three, I think, is oftentimes related to stress in that area. So you have a lot of mobility of the fourth and fifth uh, metatarsals in particular relative to the rest of the uh, uh, medial and middle column of the foot, so the midfoot joints. They have a lot of mobility, and that also can put a lot of stress in those areas. And so we think this is more of a stress-related injury, uh, but certainly blood flow can play a role in this area as well. Now, 
uh, you get debate back and forth between different surgeons and radiologists and um, residents that look at different texts or different x-rays and decide, hey, is this a zone two or a zone three? And maybe the question, in, particularly in the athlete, is whether or not it matters. After all, if you take a survey amongst AOFAS members, you can see, at least in this study, it didn't necessarily matter whether it was a zone two or a zone three in terms of who they recommended surgery for. So there can be debate, but maybe it doesn't matter so much when it comes between a zone two and a zone three. I will say that zone one usually is going to be treated non-operatively in the athlete, non-athlete, recreational person alike. One other thing to worth mentioning is what's referred to as the um, the uh, TORG classification. And this is mostly referring to that zone three type injury. That's that the type that is a little more distal, stress related. So these describe what the um, bone looks like. So a TORG type one has a little bit of thickening. So it's probably stress related, but not necessarily having a ton of pain. In a zone two, it's going to see, you're going to see a little bit more of medullary sclerosis. You're going to see some prodromal symptoms. You're going to see uh, uh, some pre-existing symptoms, at least. A uh, TORG type 3 is going to be uh, basically a frank non-union. Physical exam is oftentimes pretty straightforward. They're going to have pain over the outside part of the foot. Um, occasionally, you know, you've had some, a trainer uh, come off with off the field with the athlete and they'll say, I think they have a Jones fracture or fifth metatarsal fracture. I'm concerned about that. Um, the type ones, the TORG type ones, oftentimes are going to be more swollen and painful, maybe bruising, that kind of thing. The type two or three may not be as swollen or as bruised as the type one. And the theory being that they're going to oftentimes... Um, Maybe they had the non-union that they broke through or, or something like that. That's maybe a little bit of a less acute presentation. And I've had patients anywhere from the from the realm of of players being carted off the field to uh, players being running up and down the side trying to shake it off, if you will. So it certainly can present in a wide variety of uh, descriptions. Uh, maybe not a lot to say uh, about physical exam outside of mentioning the subtle cavus foot. Now, we know that that's associated with increased lateral stress, and, it, and it's not as important from the management of, like, osteotomies. We get into all sorts of discussions with the cavus foot. What kind of osteotomy are you going to use to correct that? In the athlete, we're typically not going to do that, at least not in our first line of treatment. Uh, but it is important to recognize it because when you're rehabbing them, you need to be prepared to um, offload them in an orthosis um, or a modified shoe. Other descriptors have been uh, prominence along the fifth metatarsal. Uh, they talk about a wide four or five minute metatarsal angle, talk about things such as metatarsus deductus, all being associated with seeing it, uh, or being increased risk of developing a fifth metatarsal fracture. Standard workup would consist of radiographs, and so this would be uh, three-view foot x-rays. Uh, the oblique view is the money view in terms of showing us the most detail when it comes to the fifth metatarsal, but certainly the AP and the lateral view can be helpful as well. Uh, it's worth mentioning the vitamin D and calcium. Vitamin D in particular uh, can be low. A lot of our athletes, we have that information beforehand, and we know that they're at risk, but it is worth mentioning that vitamin D is important to check and to um, use in the rehab of these injuries because it is so frequently low. And then this is off-label, but there's more interest in using things such as teriparatide um, in terms of the management. And, and oftentimes that's going to be recommended uh, in consultation with an endocrinologist, but it's something that has been out there and discussed in the management of stress-related injuries. And certainly fifth metatarsal is a difficult one to get to heal. For many years, we treated these non-operatively, um, and the thought being that we just needed to keep them off of it for a while. Uh, that consisted, if you're really going to treat them non-op, we say six weeks non-weight-bearing, and then it's gradually advancing weight-bearing over about a three to four-week period of time. The risk, though, is your refracture or non-union rate. What are the risks? Well, if you take surgery, your advantage of surgery is an earlier return to activity and a decreased risk of non-union. The downside, obviously, is you know, infection and expense. But when you talk about healing rates between the two, non-operatively in the acute situation, you have about one out of four 
that will end up not healing. And in the operative group, it's about a 96% chance of healing. In the chronic, it's about one out of three and 97% chance, at least according to uh, this review. So you can certainly see why we start to consider operative treatment, particularly when you consider this, uh, you're considering this in the athlete. So our operative treatment by line, by far and away is gonna be uh, intramedullary screw, at least uh, in our area, we will use an intramedullary screw and that involves um, going in under fluoroscopy, getting a guide, guide wire into the intramedullary canal and advancing it down the canal. So that looks something like this. You can see getting that start point just right. We talk about a start point of high and inside, and obviously that depends on the athlete's uh, anatomy and structure, but high and inside is the general uh, principle. We get that guide wire in the right position. I like to try to cheat it just a little bit to the lateral side so as not to book that open, as you can see in the example, in the animated example on the, on the right. Uh, but, uh, you know, you kind of sometimes, it, it, it sometimes slides right down the canal and other times you have to work it a little bit more. So as you can see here, we're a little bit off. So what we do is we get that start point just right. We open up the proximal aspect of the fifth metatarsal and then you can oftentimes introduce a non-cannulated drill into the canal, which gives you a little bit more control. And then you can use this even sometimes on hand to work yourself down the canal so you avoid penetrating, because that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid penetrating the cortex. We want to keep that in the canal. And the challenge gets to be that sclerosis that occurs can push you from one side to the next. So using a solid drill bit can be a technique tip to help um, advance the wire. Once you get the wire in the spot that you want it to be, um, then we go ahead and tap. General feeling is we want to get as wide a screw that is as short as possible, meaning that we want to get the threads just past the fracture site and then use the widest screw possible. And most of the time, this is going to be a 5.5 millimeter screw that we're going to use to, um, to fix it. And, um, and then a 40 is pretty common, I would say, with these injuries. So here, we, this is the goal is to get an intramedullary screw on all three views. We make sure we get all three views in surgery so we don't get fooled. And um, then at 12 weeks or so, we see a nice solidly united fifth metatarsal. It's worth mentioning that there's some series out there describing plating of fifth metatarsal fractures. The goal of the screw was to help avoid or minimize soft tissue complications um, with the fifth metatarsal because it's such a percutaneous, it's such a superficial structure. But this series initially was eight and now more, um, it's, a, it's a larger series at 44 patients where they used the plantar plating. So you're putting it, the advantage of it being that you put this on the plantar side. So it looks something like this. You can see here on the AP view and the um, lateral view, you can see that plate is cheated on that plantar lateral surface. And the idea is that the plantar side of the fifth metatarsal is under tension. So by putting a plantar plate you're actually compressing, and in, in compressing it, I should say, that you are compressing against the forces that you're trying to impose. So it gives you some mechanical advantage. And at least biomechanically, there is some advantage on the plantar plate as compared to an intramedullary screw. Now you might think, well, gosh, that's gonna put you at risk of feeling the plate but in actuality, that's been pretty well tolerated. Um, and that's borne out in the literature and at least personal experience as well. So both are options. And I think it depends a little bit on the athlete, the fracture pattern, surgeon preference, but these are kind of the two strategies that I would say are most relevant, at least in what, uh, March of 2024. Uh, we use a lot of biologics when it comes to the athlete because um, we're trying to promote healing and stimulate healing. We know that's a difficult area to heal. If it's a stress-related injury where there's a gap, I'll open it and pack bone graft into that area. Sometimes we'll use some injectable materials as well. We'll use some bone marrow aspirate, which we can actually pull out some of the um, growth factors and use that to help stimulate some healing um, and uh, promote, some, promote healing in the, in the fifth metatarsal. 
it's been said not if but when these recur and we talked about you know good success with getting with surgical treatment but not all of them heal and certainly there can be some cases where you think they're healed and then you come back and get an x-ray sometimes not even for pain on that side and you start to see these resorb or you start to see the fifth metatarsal fracture almost showing itself again now um, the management could be taking everything out plating it um, to, and bone grafting that area or a repeat screw depending on on what you're given uh, but also uh, there's been described um, leaving the hardware in place and then doing some bone graft around it this is an area where maybe non-operative treatment can have some utility but you want to do that in cases where the screw is well fixed it's stable it's not loose um, and you're not it, it, it still has a good fixation in that case Another discussion we have is accelerated rehab and return to play. Uh, there's different thoughts on this. In season, um, I think there's good support uh, to promote kind of an earlier return to play. If things are humming along perfectly, um, I think you, we can get people back at eight weeks. That's a reasonable timeline to expect. It is important to counsel them that there is an increased risk of uh, non-union or re-injury. In, in that case, there's at least one study showing that in some athletes who uh, accelerated their rehab, I think going back to football in that case, that if it was less than nine weeks, then their risk of re-injury um, re or a, a surgery down the road was increased. So it certainly is something to counsel them on. It doesn't mean that every, the rates are still really high, at least in Dr. Anderson's study, he reported very high union rates and, and with kind of an average return of um, nine weeks or so. So it obviously depends on a lot of things on the position, the athletes, um, where they are in school or in their profession, how the team is doing, um, but it, it certainly can be done. Um, if it's out of season, then we take our time and we give it some time to let it to heal, to let things heal and let the, um, uh, make sure that on x-ray and CT scan, we're nice and solidly healed, which is about 12 weeks or so. And then we let them advance back to their sport as they can tolerate. So in conclusion, some of the controversies that I think are current uh, would be whether you classify them on um, two versus three zones. Does it really matter? Uh, are we treating these operatively or non-operatively? Uh, plates and versus screws in terms of your mode of fixation and how aggressively or uh, accelerated you're gonna let them rehab versus a, a little bit more uh, slowed down uh, type of rehab. Hope you enjoy. If you enjoy, it, hope this is helpful. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe below uh, so you don't miss any other videos that we release. Thanks.